So recent events made it clear that this is a conversation that the country is having such a difficult time having. And I certainly, is, is, it's above my pay grade, but thank goodness uh, we have two incredible people to join us. Heather McGee, author of The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together, also the chair of the racial justice organization, Color of Change, and Dr. Philip Atiba Goff, CEO of the Center for Policing Equity, chair of African-American studies and psychology professor at Yale University uh, are joining us now. And we've got uh, Kason Wilson and Rob Christensen are going to be joining us as well. Heather, Philip, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Heather, I I'm going to start with you if that's okay. This incident, on top of all the other incidents, feels different, feels like even the vocabulary of our terrible cycle that we're in it it can't be used on this one as it's five black officers. And, and how does that change the conversation? And what do you make now of, of that dynamic? Well, I think there are some racial dynamics, even to the fact that we saw such swift uh, action by the, by the city uh, in terms of the charges and the dismissal of these five officers. And, and we are now seeing that, a, that an additional white officer who was on the scene and brutalized uh, the victim, Mr. Nichols, uh, is just now seeing some some accountability and consequences. But yes, for days we saw a, a stream of black faces in blue uniforms as the uh, the attackers and as uh, the people who caused Mr. Nichols' death, and that is not what we are used to seeing. And so it makes us have to reckon with the fact that even though as Americans, we tend to want to look at everything through an individual lens, is this a good guy mm -hmm. or a bad guy, that fundamentally the problem with policing in America is not about black or white or black versus white. It's about blue versus black. Diversity doesn't fix systemic issues. Right. We've created a system of over-policing, over-incarceration, over-surveillance, and disinvestment in the things that we actually need as communities and families to be healthy and well and safe. This country at all levels of government spends roughly double on police, prisons, and courts, what it spends on anti-hunger and anti-poverty measures. You know, our, our budgets wow. really reveal our values and we care more about policing people, brutalizing people, taking away their freedom than we do about making sure that they can thrive. And and you throw in bombs and tanks, and I bet that figure looks even that's exactly right. Even more disturbing. Philip, you you work with a lot of police departments in in terms of this. And we've seen, I, I think, a real effort to try and reckon with it. And and the reforms are well. What if we had some some de-escalation training? Ha, hey, how about this? Let's throw a camera on that. You know, you know what? No chokehold. Let's not do the chokehold this time. Yet none of it seems to address that core issue that I think Heather is talking about. So what's what is your feeling about? Are are we looking in the right places for reform? So this should be a place where we're doing everything and um, all options should be on the table. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the stuff that we've done um, hasn't received the kind of investment that it would need to see um, significant change, but we're definitely avoiding looking at some places that are the biggest levers for change. Um, so I, we've talked about the sort of shock of seeing, well, this time it was black officers. We usually don't see that. Um, Heather rightly points out that the black officers were immediately uh, uh, fired or almost immediately fired and charged while we're still waiting on the white officers and paramedics. Um, but the reason why that's shocking is because we've got the wrong definition of the problem. And that means we're, we're not trying a whole bunch of the most important solutions. The definition of the problem we've got is that, well, individual contaminated hearts and minds go in and it's their biases that we've got to undo, mm -hmm. right? Somehow it's, it's some kind of defect of the soul that needs to be cured as if that's not a problem for Saturdays and Sundays. Um, but the reality is that's not how it works. I am literally a psychology professor. I can tell you that that's not even how human psychology works, right? It's the situations we put people in that are way bigger predictors of what people actually do. So if we want the behaviors to change, we need to put folks in different situations, which is to say, we need to not have law enforcement responding to places where we don't want a badge and a gun as a potential consequence for what the heck is going on. And if we're not willing to look at that, to look at the fact that these systems are incredibly well-funded, as Heather says, in Memphis, for instance, it's 40% of the municipal budget, 38% if we want to be exact. Um, 
it's not that it's it's poorly funded and they're poorly trained. It's that we're spending a bunch of money to have them do exactly what we ask them to do. Yes. And then we're upset about the consequences as if we've not paid attention to the rules of the game in the first place. So that that's what needs some change if we really want to see some change. Man, do I think that is what what a phenomenal point that is. And that we have outsourced society's responsibility for the ills of poverty and struggle to teachers and police officers. And we, because we hire them and say, okay, you, you guys deal with that. And then we use them as scapegoats when they do the thing that we are paying them to do. We are, we are using the police as a border patrol between wealthy communities and poor communities, between white communities and between black and brown communities. And they are doing the thing that we've hired them to do. And there is something to when you empower someone with authority, when you give them a uniform, there is something that happens to good people. And, and you add a uniform and adrenaline and a weapon into a situation. It's like if, if road rage was legalized and then we get, and then we scapegoat them. So how do we, how do we, it's us, we're the problem. And how do we fix that? <laughs> oh, Philip, you're the psychologist. Fix this. No, this is this is not a psychology question. You're asking a spiritual question about the soul of a nation. Um, and I'm pretty sure that Heather is the one who's qualified <laughs> to do that. Didn't you get your degree in spiritual <laughs> redemption of the soul of a nation? Soul Heather, of a nation, Heather. Fix it. That's that's <laughs> ki that's kind of the issue here. I mean, I, what I will tell you is if we're afraid to face things, we're not fixing any of it. And if we haven't appropriately diagnosed the problem, then right. we can't fix any of it. When you say that we are the problem, I, I want to just double down on that, at least in a couple of spaces. First, I want to say it is in many cities, 911 calls that are the number one way in which law enforcement contacts communities. So it's literally us calling police, meaning society, us calling police on other folks in there. But it's not us, all of us. Right. It's usually folks who are in distressed communities who wish they could call for mental health, who wish they could call for substance abuse, who wish even more than any of that, they could call for money so that the, the lot next door was not vacant. Right. So that they had other resources. Those are the folks who were calling 911 and then 911 shows up. And to your point about how we use them. And by the way, great that we rely on teachers and law enforcement because the pay is fantastic. <laughs> um, <clears throat> <laughs> but but the deal is law enforcement has been saying for more than two decades, you ask us to do too much and then you blame us when we do it wrong. Right. They are the number one responders to mental health issues mm -hmm. and they get at best eight hours of training on critical incidents, which is how we ended up with the number one largest mental health facility in the world being the L.A. County Jail. If this is not a question of there are people wow. we don't want to see, so we neglect them and then we punish them for the fact we didn't want to invest them in the first place, like it is absolutely the, the platonic ideal of us being more interested in burying our decision not to invest in people than being interested in fixing the problem. I mean, Heather, that's when he talks about diagnosing the, the problem, and, and you mentioned earlier that the budget being kind of a window into the soul, let's say of a nation and what their priorities are. How, how deep is this? And are we fixing a gaping wound with a, with a bandaid then? And, and are we even looking at the wrong pathology? Well, listen, I mean, I think we're having a broader conversation than Mr. Nichols. It's not clear exactly, um, you know, how, how many laws and and municipal codes he actually violated, right? This seems to have been a person who should have been able to go through his day and his night and be home with his four-year-old today. That said, the whole conversation in America about how necessary policing is comes under the context of, well, we've always got to keep ourselves safe, right? That's why we justify spending so much money Mm -hmm. and why we justify uh, this, this system. But fundamentally, if you look at the roots of crime, the picture is pretty clear. If you control for poverty, rural, suburban, urban places, majority white, majority of color, all of those disparities that we see virtually disappear. What we need to do is compare what this country spends on 
policing, which is about $100 billion a year, Mm -hmm. the federal level. We could end homelessness for 20. We could create a universal pre-K program for another 20, 26. We could eliminate poverty altogether among families with children, all the neglect, the abuse, the, um, you know, the hunger, the stress, the, the mental strife that comes from poverty for $70 billion a year, right? And somehow those never get truly fully funded. And yet we as a society are spending more on police than we did before George Floyd was killed. There were more deaths you know, at the hands of police last year than on record. And then zooming out, of course, we are a society with 120 handguns per 100 people. And so, you know, Phil and John, you're both right to say that this is about the systems and structures and that the systems and structures are reflective of a deeper belief that we have. And in in my research, I've found it really comes back to the way this country was founded on a belief in a hierarchy of human value. We don't have the just sort of gut level presumption among one another that we are fully human. And where did that begin? Where has it been perpetuated generation after generation has Mm -hmm. been in this caste system we have around race. But like so much of systemic racism, it doesn't mean that white people get you know, off scot-free from it, right? There were over 300 white people who were killed by police last year, um, right? 366 white people were killed by police. 254 Black people were killed by police. Now, there are nearly 200 million more white people than there are Black, but one out of three Americans gets arrested in this country, right? We create these systems in order to control a targeted community, but ultimately, Racism in our systems, in our politics, in our policymaking has a cost for everyone. No one wants to live like this. Heather, you are dangerously close to CRT, and I'm afraid Ron DeSantis (laughs) is going to shut this podcast down. Uh, But that, when something has taken decades and decades to build up, which is, as you said, a caste system. And I'm sorry, I don't see how you can argue that there hasn't been a caste system set up in this country. And even to the point where I think we have criminalized struggle. In the old days, it was debtor's prison, but now it's poverty has been criminalized. Philip, a white kid in the suburbs does not do less drugs than a black kid in the city. But they go to prison almost never. So how do you decriminalize struggle? How do you decriminalize living in that system that we've built, that caste system. So the interesting uh, way to answer that is, you know, the joke about uh, you go to the doctor who says, hey, doc, it hurts when I do it like this. Doc says, well, don't do that. That's how you work on decriminalization. <laughs> Wait, um, that's it? You, you decriminalize it. Yeah. So so the, the, in uh, the, the last uh, Democratic uh, administration, the Obama administration, uh, which was the last time we were talking about this in a major way, they, they had a task force on 21st century policing. They said, hey, we're not investing in these places and we're punishing them for the things that come when you don't invest in places. So we should invest in them and stop punishing them, which is a good thing. This is the first time in this country we'd ever done that, except prior to that. And after the 1990s, we had the, the big uprisings around um, the Rodney King beating and the exoneration of those officers. And there was a big presidential task force on that. And they said, you know what? We don't invest in these places and we punish them for that. We should invest in these places and stop punishing them for it. And that was the first time in this country we had done that, uh, except for about 30 years prior when 1968, we had the Kerner Commission where they said, you know what, we don't invest in these communities and we punish them for it. And so what we should do is invest in these communities and stop punishing them for it. That was the first time we had done that in this country. <laughs> so for 30 years prior to that, where we had, oh, you understand so, that there's a pattern huh, to this. No learning curve. But you say we've done that, Phil. You mean there's been a blue ribbon commission, but it doesn't mean that we've had funds flowing into these communities as a response. But isn't that because it's politically untenable? You know, after the George Floyd, we had six months of we really need to look at policing. And then Fox News and all their brethren ran with the country's in chaos. Crime is rampant. Everything is going. And immediately, even the biggest proponents of, yes, we need to look at policing suddenly said and make sure that we give them more money, more helmets, more weapons. And I'm not honestly like I'm I am very close to police communities and and first responder communities. So I have blind spots galore. I have incredible esteem for them, although I also understand you have to hold them to the highest of standards. But my experience with them is 
they are victims in this system as well. I know that's, but they, they're being asked to do something that is impossible and that is fix poverty. And yeah. Yeah, they're, they're tools of a system that brutalizes people who've always already been disinvested, yes. right? And that feels awful. Yes. So, I mean, I work closely with folks who are retired law enforcement. I got retired police chiefs that work at CPE. I work closely with current law enforcement as well as activists, right? And I got to say, the problem is not the individual officers. Mm -hmm. The problem is what we have accepted it's okay to use state dollars to do, which is not to treat folks with mental health uh, concerns and substance abuse issues, right. treat people who don't have housing, but it is to punish people when they have those sets of problems. And we've been doing it forever. And you say it's politically untenable. Part of the reason it's politically untenable is because I do that little bit of, of low grade comedy. And I apologize doing that in front of a comedy God, but I'm no, doing every no, 20 no. to 30 years, we do this mess. I don't even know if I'm allowed to curse on this. You may. Um, but every, every 20 to 30 years, we do this. And then collectively we decide that was cool. Can we please forget? Cause it's super uncomfortable. It's only politically untenable because there are people like Ron DeSantis who've decided it's not okay to learn our history. We are able to move this forward when people realize how much of this we've done before. Well, because it's weaponized, Philip and Heather, I want to speak to that. When you talk about reform, reform has to be perfect in this country. Because let's say you do redesign a system and one of the individuals within that redesigned system mm -hmm. commits something that is, a well, then the whole thing gets torn down because it has to be perfect because Atwater decided that Willie Horton was going to be used in an ad against Michael Dukakis and George H.W. Bush won the presidency. And so now it has to be zero tolerance for anything. I, I really feel like like it has, if it's not perfect, we won't do it. We have no fortitude. We have no resilience to deal with the tribulations and trials of redesigning a better system. Well, that's right, because you have people whose financial and political self-interest lies in capitalizing on those examples. Right. People who profit from selling a story of racial division and hierarchy and scapegoating. You know, you mentioned Ron DeSantis, and I think it's really important that we put this in the context of the hyper-organized, well-funded, completely partisan backlash to the racial consciousness raising that we've had in this country, which is probably the most powerful thing to come out of the summer of 2020's uh, history-making uh, social demonstrations, right? We had probably mm -hmm. 300 state and local police reforms, but we also had a massive consciousness raising, right? People saw things that they would never be able to unsee. They read things and learned things and asked different questions and the dialogue completely shifted. And that terrified the right wing, not because they in their hearts and minds, you know, hate black and brown people. That's not what I'm litigating here. What I'm litigating here is that they've known for generations, really ever since the civil rights movement, that the way to get a governing coalition to remain relevant and be able to redistribute wealth upwards has been to scapegoat right. and to race bait. And so if you've got, you know, another 20, 30, 40% of white people being inoculated against the Willie Hortons and the CRT nonsense, then they can't do what they want to do, right? They can't still have the political power to, to you know, enact right. tax cuts and stuff like that. And so you see right now that this moment of uh, three years almost since the crescendo of a movement that really began uh, with Michael Brown's murder and Ferguson and Trayvon Martin's murder in Florida is a really fraught one. Because if we don't keep our eye on the prize of the kind of systemic reforms, which frankly would make everyone better off, right? If we spent more money on childcare and healthcare and anti-poverty measures and housing, everybody would be better off than if we spend that money um, locking people up and creating systems of violence and oppression, state-sponsored violence and oppression. That's infrastructure, human infrastructure. Exactly. This is the moment when we need to stay focused and not be distracted by individual stories um, and exceptions and, and race baiting from the right wing. Heather, that's amazing. Kay, you've got something. I, first of all, just want to say, well, that's, that's, that's why we said defund the police. 
if you're wondering <laughs> out there, that's what it all was. Uh, but I do want to ask you guys this question because I think when the decriminalization conversation comes up, one thing that infuriates me is we talk about people's past sins in their victimhood in a way that makes me very uncomfortable. Uh, for instance, George Floyd, his entire trial, we're discussing this man's past as if the police officers who had anything to do with this had a PDF of everything he did in his life when, when, they, <laughs> when they confront this man. And it's, it, is not, it is unfair, it's unjust, and it's wrong to prosecute a victim at someone else's trial. And I wonder if we are to engage with this Tyree Nichols story um, in a way that we did with Eric Garner and Breonna Taylor and Amar Arbery and all of these victims, and we discuss police reform. Is there any police department, any city that we can point to that enacted a change that we can look at to say, whenever we reach a height of racial inequity, racial inequality, when we when we hit these high viral stories, we actually have an effect of policy that can come from it because we're going to discuss this. I'm not watching a video. I'm just telling y'all now. I ain't watching. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. I'm watching Martin and I'm keeping my mental health together. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there something that we can look to to say when these stories do go viral, this is the change that can come from it, even if it's small? Mm. Yeah, th- there are thousands of examples. And I really thank you for asking the question because I really wish that more folks who had larger platforms would ask the question and then would amplify them. Um, And you led with, uh, well, you led with defund, but I I think that that all goes together with the concern we've got around litigating someone's um, moral, you know, perfection before we're able to say, actually, this was a problem. This is, by the way, why we have stories about Rosa Parks, but we don't have stories about Claudette Colvin. Right, who was the 15-year-old girl right, who right. really began the Montgomery bus boycott moment, but because her personal life was such that it was difficult to put that on a poster, we needed to get an older woman, and then we we sanitized that. She couldn't be an organizer. She was just tired. How awful was it? She was just tired. It was not, I mean, she planned a whole mass mobilization issue. She'd spend a, a, her entire life dedicated to these issues, but really it was just about her being tired. That's part of the reason and how we ended up here because Heather's quite right, there are people who make their money off of these narratives. But the flip side to that is that we are so, and I've just been told I'm allowed to curse, we are shit at producing the other side of that narrative. What are the emotional appeals that disarm there are bad people that need punishment? What do you run on that is the opposite of that? And the only thing we've come close to is a scolding adults do better, which by the way, no one wants to vote for I have to be an adult. If, if the millennial generation has taught us anything is that adulting is incredibly hard and it is not appealing on mass. So one of the ways that we can, can do the emotional appeal is that it's not about being tough on bad people. It's about creating communities that are strong enough. We don't have to pay the fuck attention to them, right? And so places like Ithaca and Tompkins County, New York, where they said, you know what? We don't want to send armed responders to nonviolent crises. Like, just fuck all that. Places like Berkeley, California, which began the national movement, and I'm happy to say CPE played a significant role in the analysis that led to this, but they said, you know what, low-level traffic enforcement, let's not do that. There's this radical thing that we've just invented in Berkeley and Berkeley only called the mail, and we can send you a ticket. Isn't that amazing? Um, And it turns out that there's this thing on the East Coast called Easy Pass, and they had figured that out a generation before, which allows for people in Philadelphia to enjoy the same basic privileges of getting something in the mail. It's shitty, by the way, to get it in the mail, but it's way shittier to have a gun in your face as a result of it. By the way, Tyree Nichols, Keenan Anderson, still alive if we're not doing low-level traffic enforcement um, and nonviolent accidents with armed responders, right? That Berkeley led to Philly, led to Seattle, led to Pittsburgh, and a small pilot project in LA. The STAR program in Denver, which sends no police, sends actual mental health experts, gasp, to mental health crises instead of badges and guns. And by the way, if they're scared for their safety, they can call the police just like anybody else, and the police will rush right over. In fact, they've got a hotline to it. There are thousands of these local experiments that are mostly working, but they're underfunded in terms of evaluation, so we don't have great data on them, making it harder to make the, like you've heard Heather and I just talking stats back and forth because we're both aggressive nerds, Um, (laughs) but it helps on policy as well. So we've underfunded the back end of it, which means it's hard to scale. And because federal folks can't take credit 
for local interventions most of the time, they don't like talking about them. So we've got to demand that our language, our narratives change so that we've got an emotional appeal that also references specific things that work because it turns out the kinds of changes that defund activists were calling for, again, laziness by electeds on why defund became so villainized rather than the ineffectiveness of defund because defund was hella effective. Everybody knows what I'm talking about when I say it, even though they don't, they'll, they'll define it terribly. Um, but the deal is on that front, if we would allow, or we would, sorry, sorry, we would demand that people would lift up these individual um, elements and we would say, hey, this is stronger communities. Those kinds of demands are 70%, 73% popular among white Republicans because they have law enforcement in their family, right? They know that law enforcement get asked to do too much. And they know that it is the least safe places for law enforcement are at a traffic stop are in mm -hmm. communities where they don't have good connection, which is why the kinds of changes I'm talking about, when CPE does them, we see a 13% reduction in officer injuries. So when Heather says everybody benefits from this, that is what she is talking about. These things that seem so radical right now because they're a radical departure from our collective hatred of black people are actually radically redemptive of the entire soul of the nation and allow for folks who are in harm's way, who rush towards the danger, to be safer on the other side of it. It is only our calculated desire to ensure that there's a group of people who suffer that allow it to maintain its polit political practicability. Philip, I'm sorry, your, your Zoom box is on fire. It's <laughs> on fire, Philip. That says it all. I mean, that, Heather. What, what, we, now me? Because, <laughs> no, because it's, that, that, that's, narrative storytelling this is the part where where we understand it we don't know the facts we don't know the figures we haven't been in the communities but what we do know is narrative storytelling and what philip is talking about is you have the story the story is real the soul of a nation is obviously redeemable but we're why is it so hard to tell that story why is fear Mm. such a powerful motivator and driver. And what he just said right now, the way he said it, how do you squeeze that into a bottle and drink it? I mean, how, how do we get that? It is absolutely true that everything we believe comes from a story we've been told. And the stories that we've been told about each other about crime, about different communities that are not like us are mostly filtered through our big megaphones, right? What are our big megaphones? They are television, social mm -hmm. media, and news media. So television, right? Color of Change two years ago released a groundbreaking report called Normalizing Injustice, which actually looked at the most popular shows on television. What's the formula for the most popular show on television? Crime procedurals, right? We are entertained by mm -hmm. the spectacle of cops and robbers and victims and good guys and bad guys. It, you know, there's nothing like it. Nothing touches it except for reality TV and 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 crime dominates there too, right? right. And and what Color of Change found was that the stories that Hollywood is telling about crime fundamentally distorts what we know as policymakers and advocates to be true and what communities that are over police know to be true. And that ultimately ends up creating the permission structures for bad police policies, for more money to police, and for a sort of colorblind look at what is a deeply, deeply racist system, one. Two, when we look at what are the stories in our political narratives, right? We've got mostly white politicians in this country, right? Two out of three of the politicians in this country at every level are white men, you know, uh, up to 90% of politicians in this country are white. And so on a bipartisan basis, even though, of course, Democrats have a much more diverse caucus, you've got this, at worst, well-honed script for using racial fear to bring the majority of white voters over to a political party that has an economic agenda that defunds everything we care about, right? And funds the war machine and the police machine. 
That's at worst, right? People who are know exactly how to capitalize on racial fear among white people in order to create a majority white coalition and create the majority of white people in the Republican camp. And then at best, I'm just going to be real here. You've got mostly white Democrats who are fumbling around, right? They are in the, they are terrified of losing one more white voter. Right. Because we know that the majority of white voters have not voted for a Democrat for president since Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act into law to this day. Are you saying uh, causation equals correlation? Is that what we're, <laughs> that what we're suggesting? I'm saying I'm saying that this country has had racially polarized politics throughout its entire history mm-hmm. and that ultimately a white Democrat is a minority. Right. And so there's this fear of white grievance, fear of white backlash that makes it difficult for what are mostly white political leaders who maybe want to do the right thing to have the confidence to be able to say, this is the America we want to build. And this is actually what we're willing to change about the status quo. These are the experiments we're willing to put forward. And what we're not willing to do is to keep doing more of the same. Can you incentivize a system that isn't a fear-based economy? Because, you know, everything that you talk about, the media makes its money on this very thing that you talk about. The Mm -hmm. unobtainium that that drives this nation is a fear-based economy. During the election cycle in New York, you would have thought, that Mad Max was on the loose. And this was that we were living in Thunderdome. The commercials that ran in between every show, Lee Zeldin literally said, vote as if your life depends on it because it does. That was his closing argument. Yep. Because the argument that you and Philip are making, and I think that, that we are trying to make is, Investment in human capital improves outcomes across the board, and you right. see it everywhere. I want to ask Rob. Rob, your family is is you know look they're they're mostly law enforcement, right? You got a good law enforcement military family, and you've been in jail, so you can talk <laughs> about you can talk about both sides. But in 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 your mind, is this conversation happening? In your family. So the closest relative that's a cop is my brother. And uh, I always ask him when something's happened in the news, every time I see him, I talk to him about this thing. And his response is always, well, uh, you know me my whole life. Why would you think I would behave that way? And then I'm like, I don't I don't care if I know you your whole life. We got to talk about this. He gets it from all sides of the family. So I guess we're good in that regard. But like, I can never be like a cab, all, all cops are bastards or, or, or anything like that. Because I have one cop, my brother, who like, you know, I love, so I love a cop. So I don't know, I'm kind of caught in between here. I, I, I love a cop. Too. I mean, I, I, I'm, I think most people who have that, you know, and, and I think what Philip is saying is it's not about that individual's heart. Right. And, and I wonder, does he ever talk about, does your brother ever talk about like, this system is fucking me because I'm, we are flooded with guns and it's incredibly dangerous for me out there. And so how can I not be on DEFCON 1 at all times. And and this is, an they've put me in an impossible position. Yeah, I mean, we do talk about it all the time. And he would, uh, he doesn't like when he's with other cops that are really hot, especially in a traffic stop. Uh, it's like, how do you believe the brother of a cop when he's going to say, my, my brother's a great cop, you know, he's a good cop. But my brother, he got like commendations for uh, not using force, which is something crazy that they give medals for not beating people up. And then uh, they also use some of his like body cam footage on how he handles situations to train other cops. So if I have any evidence on that, he's a good cop. That's all I can say that I have. And when we talk about it, he's like, I don't like cops who are hot headed. I don't like them who are coming out, especially at traffic stops coming to go hard. I don't know if my brother might have been the right type of person to be a cop. He was like very popular, well liked, never lost a street fight and like was the <laughs> captain of his baseball team. So it's like if you have two sides of like very calm but also can handle himself, that's what my brother is. It, it's interesting because, you know, Philip, you've been in in training police officers. How do they talk about this within the departments? So, John, you asked the question, um, does Rob Brother ever say, uh, you know, the, like, they're, they're fucking me? 
If he doesn't say that every day, he's not actually a cop. Rob, you're just making it up. Um, Because I have never met a line officer who does not have 20 things in a list to complain about that they got screwed over that day, right? 19 of which are probably pretty legit. Mm -hmm. Um, Because again, we we frequently do not pay them the kind of pay that would be reasonable for someone going into the kind of dangerous situations that they're in. Um, uh, The pensions used to be extravagant. They used to say there's always two police forces, the one you're paying now and the one that's retired. Um, But now the pensions are getting taken away. Um, The union protections are not nearly uh, what they used to be, though the unions are their own sets of problems. And they've got legit grievances um, with the executive group and the city in terms of how the city treats people who are running towards danger. Right. Right. Um, So a thousand percent. That's and and we're in a period of incredibly low morale amongst law enforcement, in part because we're having conversations about how terrorizing force law enforcement has been within black communities. And almost nobody, almost nobody signed up to be a cop to be the villain in the story of an entire community. Right. But you asked whether in part whether or not like there's a way to incentivize on this. Sure, we can regulate political speech. I don't see that happening anytime soon. We can regulate what's on the airwaves. There's too much money in that to to really happen. And if not, I just want to take us back. I know it's super annoying because you got a professor on who's talking about history. (laughs) But I just want to take us back to the last times that we made serious change. The last time we made serious change around these issues um, on a national scale the whole country was on fire for a decade. Right. Right. We call it the civil rights movement. I think it's better understood as the second reconstruction, but that's what it takes for this country to pay attention. And we're doing this conversation. Um, uh, what is today? Well, on a Tuesday after the video was dropped on a Friday and national media stopped paying attention to it on a Sunday. Right. Okay. Cause there weren't cars that lit on fire. Cause nobody died during the protests in part because law enforcement didn't show up as an oppressive force. Right. So like tensions did not get inflamed. And so if you want to think about when did we do it before the civil rights movement, you got to go back to the end of slavery, which was a literal fucking war. Right. We do not do this at large scale unless everything is on fire and there's nothing else we can do. What we would rather do, like a mass aggressively dysfunctional family is like, all right, all right, we've had our fight over dinner. That was difficult. We're going to move the way that we do the potatoes from now on, okay? We're not going to put salmonella in the potatoes. Everybody can be happy. Now, can we all just sit down and have a good, a good uh, loving time? And we'll see you all again next year. And by next year, I mean next 30 years when there's another place that blows up. We do not do it unless things are on fire. And unless we've got leaders that require better of us, we're going to be here another 20, 30 years from now if we're lucky, lucky enough to all be alive by then, having this exact same fucking conversation. Wow. I mean, this has been uh, eye-opening, you know, diagnosis, and I feel like I've I've gone through the life cycle uh, of an issue. I want to be cognizant of your guys' uh, time, Heather. I'm just going to uh, give you the last word uh, as we go away. I think what Philip said is is kind of it's sobering, but hopeful. I think the the hopeful part is it seems like there really is a diagnosis. The sobering part is we've known the diagnosis for 240 years, and we only fix it uh, in those three or four cataclysms of, of violence and fire. As someone who is is working towards doing this without that, uh, you know, terrible catastrophe, where do you look at the conversation from here on? Bill said the country has to be on fire for things to change, but what's the step, right? the country's on fire and then things change automatically. No, the country's on fire and then more and more people decide that they are going to vote on this issue, that they are going to contact their legislatures on this issue, that they are going to fundamentally show up as citizens and people in a community in a different way. And so what I want to leave your listeners with is you may be outraged, you may be confused. Either way, you don't ever want to see a video like that again in your life. What have you actually done? Have you contacted your congressional leader, your senator, and said, we need to pass police reform now? Have you contacted your city council person and said, we need to divest from over-incarceration and mass policing and invest in the systems that actually care for people? If you tweet about it, if you talk to your friends about it, that doesn't mean a politician is listening. So take that one step, and that's how we can get to the place we want to be faster than the next 30 years. Well, thank you guys uh, so much. Uh, Heather McGee, uh, Philip Atiba Goff, I I can't tell you how much I appreciate your time. And uh, I hope that the next conversation that we have about this is sooner than 30 years 
and is speaking about some of the progress and some of the great stories that uh, Philip and Heather have been talking about that have been working in certain places. So thank you both uh, so much for your time. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.